Hello, I'm Mike Parker Pearson, and I'm going to be telling you about an extraordinary site that we excavated in the 90s and the noughties, and that we're finally now getting to publication. It's called Clathalen, uh, which is a, a small site in the island of South Uist. Uh, South Uist is part of the Outer Hebrides, and uh, it has a very characteristic landform called Macher. Uh, this is um, a, a grassy uh, sand dune landscape along its west coast. And uh, uh, we found that there are hundreds of unusually well-preserved archeological sites dotted along the coastline from uh, 4,000 years ago, right up to the 19th century. Uh, the site of Clath Harlan is one of a number that we excavated as part of a big project when I was at Sheffield University and when we teamed up with Cardiff University as well, uh, particularly my colleague Neil Sharples. And as you can see from the, the slide, we produced a, a small library of massive tomes, excavation reports, survey reports and other archaeological writings that have really revolutionised our understanding of the archaeology of this small but really archaeologically significant island. And uh, we've just published the first of two volumes on Clath Harlan. Uh, it's a, a Bronze Age into Iron Age um, settlement. And uh, of course, many of you may have come across its uh, recent uh, publishing of, a, of an app which allows you to go and visit the site and it will actually reconstruct the, the houses uh, uh, and you can go into the houses and you can uh, walk around as if uh, they were roofed. So that's all very exciting. Um, the site came to prominence a few years back because it was here that we discovered the very first evidence for mummification anywhere in Britain. Well, in fact, for that matter, anywhere in prehistoric Europe. And um, it started with the recovery of burials underneath the floors of a row of three round houses, which were all joined together uh, with party walls. Um, two of the houses had children underneath their floors. Those are the ones, the two towards the bottom of the picture. And, um, uh, but it was the two that were in the northern roundhouse and in the northern roundhouse that were most amazing because they turned out not only to be composite skeletons, uh, different people's anatomy joined together, but they had actually been formally mummified. And this is um, the most extraordinary one because uh, this was a woman's body with a man's head probably at least a hundred years older than her body and in her hands she was holding two of his teeth uh, the upper lateral incisors the left one in the left hand and the right one in the right hand and uh, we were able to discover that uh, she'd already been partly buried somewhere else uh, in a small pit outside of that roundhouse and it became evident during post excavation that this had been her original grave in that strange uh, figure of eight pit uh, because it had actually been, she'd been buried there as a mummy uh, somewhere around 1200 BC and then dug up somewhere around 1050 BC. And that, that was at the point which they uh, fitted her with someone else's head. We don't know what happened to hers and uh, buried her um, underneath uh, uh, in the foundations of the new house. Uh, they left her knee behind and what's probably uh, at least one grave good, possibly two, there's a very nice bone pin uh, that was left in the grave as well as a, a pumice rubber. And as a result of that, our uh, former student uh, Tom Booth, who's now uh, moved into the field of ancient DNA. He uh, did his PhD research looking at whether there was evidence for mummification elsewhere in Britain and uh, having developed a mummy identification kit to look at skeletons and work out if they'd actually uh, had uh, preservative treatment. He was able to uh, identify a whole series more just from the Bronze Age and not from the periods before or, or subsequently.
So an absolute revolution in our understanding of prehistoric uh, funerary practices. But what I'm going to, going to concentrate on today is the results that we got from analysing in enormous detail uh, what was going on in the house floors. The great thing about these roundhouses is that their floors and walls are beautifully preserved. Uh, they've been covered by sand and so it, you know, it, it's like uh, opening the door and walking in on the place just after it's been deserted. Uh, in addition to that, they were very keen on resurfacing. So having started off with these being sunken floored buildings, they kept renewing the floor by bringing in clean sand, leveling it out and putting a new fireplace and floor layer down. So as, as we dug th through layer by layer, we were able to get a, 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 an extraordinary insight into how life had been conducted generation after generation over a period that stretched more than 500 years. And one of the houses, House 401, the central roundhouse, is the longest lived roundhouse that we know of anywhere in Britain. Now, what we were able to do was to look at the distribution of uh, materials in that floor, many of them micro debris, the kind of stuff that you pick up only by putting through a one millimeter sized mesh because we floated, uh, using flotation, uh, every half square metre of sediment in each house floor. And it showed us, for example, where the pottery was uh, being broken in the, uh, in the course of cooking. Uh, and you can see that in the, the, the top left distribution plot there. It also showed us where the craft working tools of pumice and worked bone and coarse stone were being distributed, most of them concentrating in the, um, in the, in the, 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 the south uh, west of the house. And we could plot things like phosphorus. We even had a little spot for offerings in the north east quadrant of the house, which included uh, I put in a little photograph of it, a piece of iron. And given, given that we've got really tight radiocarbon dates on this particular phase between 1080 and 1040 BC at 95% probability, I don't know of an, another piece of iron anywhere in Britain that is that early. We're well and truly in the late Bronze Age. So uh, this may be an absolutely extraordinary little find. We're not entirely sure what it is. It may be part of a broken uh, bracelet or even part of a broken fibula. So what we were able to do was we could characterize what was going on in the house phase by phase. And this is from the first phase of that central roundhouse. And you can see that uh, we've got the southeast for cooking. We've got craft working and storage in the southwest. We've got a sleeping platform in the uh, northwest, and then an area of offerings and and layers of burnt material, including burnt grain, which we think were also offerings in that northeast quadrant. And then the doorway uh, is in the east, so you'd have to cross over that small stone kist as you came into the house. What was so exciting was that even before we started, we had a, a hypothesis to test, a model that was developed by uh, the archaeologist Andrew Fitzpatrick when he was digging an Iron Age roundhouse in um, Berkshire in southern England. And he suggested from the finds that he found in post holes uh, that uh, you could divide up the house in, in these, these various ways. And we realized that we were able to document exactly the patterns that he had got all the way away from southern England. Fitzpatrick's revolutionary idea was that this was actually tied in to the sunwise arrangement of domestic life. And uh, he'd noticed that houses tended to face towards the east in the late Bronze Age and Iron Age. And he suggested that activities in the house followed the movement of the sun around the heavens so that uh, you wake up, you cook the food that's in the southeast, and then you do all your living duty, uh, your living activities, uh, 
uh, to do with with craft working maybe and storing food in the southwest and then as the sun goes down below the horizon to the north that's where you sleep we took this idea and we suggested that it might be uh, also not just a homology of the, the daily diurnal cycle but also of the life cycle the idea being that uh, it, you move from birth to death in the sunrise movement around the central half and uh, we also added a, a further dimension based on uh, Lewis Binford's notion of, of drop and toss zones that if people were sitting in a, a, a semicircular arrangement around the hearth uh, looking towards the entrance then we would expect the, the actual refuse of daily life, and particularly the animal bones from people's meals, to be thrown out or dropped uh, behind and, and around them. So it was really gratifying to discover that this was exactly uh, or conform very, very closely to the patterns we were getting. And for example, in the top left there, you can see that the mammal bone distribution uh, conforms very closely to that Binfordian uh, toss and drop uh, hypothesis. But there are other interesting surprises. Um, we found that at each interval in the house's uh, reconstruction, so every time it was renewed, there was a moment of casting when in the central fireplace they would actually be casting uh, bronze uh, and uh, in crucibles and, and pouring them into moulds so that we had broken crucibles, broken moulds and also um, uh, droplets of bronze uh, centred around the, the hearth and in this particular case in that middle drawing uh, really close to the middle of the hearth sorry to, to answer on the north side of the hearth and uh, we we recovered hundreds and hundreds of mould fragments casting a whole variety of bronze tools and weaponry so it's interesting to see that the renewal of the house seems to accompany the moment of casting and I can only assume they must have done this with the roof off otherwise the whole thing would have caught light. We discovered that there were significant differences between each of the roundhouses they weren't all used in the same way the southern roundhouse for example was actually um, largely devoid of pottery pottery was very scarce compared to the, the central roundhouse but all the other activities were well represented and in the ways that we've seen in the main house with craft activities in the southwest, a small sleeping platform in the northwest and uh, an empty area with just a couple of, uh, of basic offerings in the northeast. So uh, it looks as though this is some kind of um, uh, attendant household on the main house. Um, either they were getting their food from the main house and going there or of course these could have been people who were preparing the, the food in the main house but actually lived in this smaller uh, dwelling and of course that raises all kinds of questions that we haven't got answers to uh, what was their relationship was it one of kinship is this a kind of bronze age granny flat or is it that these were people who were in some way indentured or enslaved uh, uh, to the people in, in the main house. The north house produced a different pattern again. Um, there were residues of all sorts of activities but very slight compared to the other two houses. Uh, one of the principal um, activities that seems to have gone in so, on in this house rather more so than the others was uh, potting, the uh, manufacture of pots uh, on the basis of the, the raw clay and, uh, and the uh, discarded uh, clay vessels uh, that never made it to being fired. But we also found from the soil micromorphology that this was somewhere where animals were stalled as well. So it seems to have had a, a kind of ancillary use, um, sometimes inhabited. There were, there were uh, residues, remains of a sleeping platform but it seems to have been very much off, off and on divided between all these different um, activities, not a proper dwelling as such. And then after 1000 BC, as we're moving towards the end of the Late Bronze Age, uh, the Southern House went out of use and it became a, a modular arrangement of just two structures. 
So the middle roundhouse now, the dwelling where daily life uh, was, uh, in a, it was, was uh, enacted. And then the north roundhouse, which was really an outhouse uh, for potting and, and storing animals, as I've mentioned before. We could get some really interesting insights into uh, the uh, the furniture. So there were various uh, uh, bits of stone furniture, like a, a stone uh, tank clay lined to, to uh, keep uh, fresh water in, uh, but also to see how people actually slept at this time. No individual beds, a communal uh, sleeping platform separated from the, the central space by a, a, a low uh, row of small stones. And that platform surfaced with turf uh, cut from the surrounding grasslands, presumably to make it reasonably soft uh, to sleep on. But whoever, you know, the, the household, and I would assume that it was a family of some sort, they're all sleeping together effectively on the same extended bed. And then after 800 BC, as we move into the earliest Iron Age, this is when we see that the settlement is no more than a single dwelling, so that the outhouse to the north has also disappeared. But over time, its use as a dwelling dwindled away. So for uh, at one point, the bed area disappears, and at another point later on, um, the craft workings, uh, craft working activity is replaced, and it's simply a place to store agricultural tools. The transitions in the renewal of each phase of house uh, were uh, marked by some really extraordinary uh, uh, events. And one of the aspects that we noticed happening quite regularly was that uh, a pit would be cut through the old wall line and then uh, complete or, or uh, freshly smashed pots might be introduced into that pot and then the wall of the new house built directly over the top. So these seem to be the result of some kind of feast that was held when the house was being renewed, the walls taken down and the, the wall taken off, sorry, the roof taken off and then put back up. And of course, this was also the time, as I mentioned earlier, when there was bronze casting uh, around the central hearth. So we've been able to piece together the entire sequence because of course it's beautifully stratified so that each phase can be teased out from the other. And uh, what we have is uh, an uh, amazing history. Uh, every, every generation or so, um, so we think that on average, it's about 60 to 70 years uh, between each rebuild. And we can track that over these five centuries. So that's the first lot and that's the second. Uh, that, that's the rest of them when it's just a single house. Uh, it's uh, just an amazing insight into the pace of change uh, over uh, all these centuries. And to see that uh, the Fitzpatrick model applies so very, very strongly in our results. And the material culture is huge. We have, uh, I forget just how many kilos of ceramics. Um, it's horribly made stuff, you know, most late Bronze Age, early Iron Age pottery in Britain is, uh, but it's given us an extraordinary insight into the minor changes in, in uh, the styles of ceramic. It's known as plain wear, and it's pretty plain. Uh, so it starts off like this uh, and ends up looking like that. Um, so this is when we get into the early Iron Age and we're looking at food being served in these, these very large bowls, so cooked and served. There's not much in the way of individual serving vessels, bowls, or, or even cups. Um, so it seems to be a, a relatively communal form of, of uh, sharing out of the big, uh, the big, big porridge bowl. And then at the end of Clathalan, what we see is that the roundhouses are deserted. And uh, 
two small um, double round houses are built, one to the north of the row and another 100 metres away. Um, one of them is for bronze casting, but uh, this one was the most curious one at the end of, of the row, built on the side of what was now an abandoned settlement. And it had the most extraordinary uh, collection of, of material in there. Lots of burnt cobbles uh, for heating steam and the remnants of uh, one end, what really seemed to be a, like a great big sort of chimney, heavily blackened um, and uh, packed with, with burnt cobbles. And then when we looked at the debris uh, within the floor, we could see we had a lot of burnt material up at that end. And um, we think that it's uh, most likely that this was uh, a building that acted both as a smokery and a steam room. Um, uh, interestingly, another one was found at the very same year as this on North Uist by Ian Armit, who independently came to the same conclusion as we did. Uh, what is uh, sad about uh, this particular building is that uh, in 1917, a local antiquary visited and he recorded the story of workmen searching out stone to build the cemetery, the modern cemetery of Clath Harland. Clath is the Gaelic for cemetery, it's Harland Cemetery. And uh, he reports about how they uh, were, they chanced upon a completely preserved, full standing, corbel roofed, beehive shaped stone building, uh, which he says was uh, 12 feet high. And uh, they set about it, he said, because the supervisor's antiquarian sensibilities were undeveloped and uh, reduced it entirely. And I think this may be the very house, the very structure that, uh, that he was writing about. Um, it just gives us though, a flavour of what may be preserved under all the other hundreds of sand dunes uh, within which lay all these prehistoric settlements.